Hey, what's up guys? Gons here for the Face Like the Sun YouTube channel. I hope you've been enjoying the Dr. Michael Heiser lectures. It was an honor to have him visit us last week and share his knowledge and wisdom. I think it's really important for Christians to consider some of the studies that Dr. Heiser has to offer through his work and through the book, The Unseen Realm. And I know some of you guys feel like this is just shameless plug, but honestly, I don't like plugging anything really that much. And the reason why I'm plugging Dr. Heiser's work is because I think it has substance. I think it is meat for the church that desperately needs it. And, you know, it's just one of those works that the man has dedicated his life to. And I just think it's worth considering if you're a Christian. And not only that, but it is really the work that is giving all the stuff that we look at in this community teeth tangible biblical precedents that I think much of the church simply ignores. But given the topic that I'm going to dive into today in this video, I think understanding what Dr. Heiser is talking about is pivotal. Now, he won't go there with this. Dr. Heiser won't necessarily agree with the things I say here or, you know, even endorse it to some sense in terms of its actuality because he's very open about his eschatology and staying pretty agnostic in that realm. And I mean that not in the sense of agnostic, you know, not believing or don't believing in God or not sure of it. I'm talking about just in the realm of eschatology, of what's going to happen, what's going to unfold in our future. So he shies away from the speculation about the future. Now, some of you guys might be saying, yeah, this is what you do, Gons, on this channel, speculate all day long. But no, I'm not really speculating. I'm more forecasting. I stay pretty grounded and sometimes I might say something that seems off or seems ridiculous. But again, when we're talking about the future, we just don't know, okay? We have no idea what actually will take place. What we can do, though, is look at the patterns and the history of what we've done in various sectors of human society and project, at least look forward as to where such activity in our history and all of the things that have built up civilization, where it looks like it's headed. And my whole message has always been, I think it's headed towards what biblical prophecy lays out. And I think that is consistent with God's character in that he is outside of space and time. He wrote history before it happens. And I think he showed us in scripture that these things are plausible. Now, one of the things I've been talking a lot about is this digital realm, right? The spiritual realm, the digital realm, the comparisons, and perhaps even the interaction that will ultimately lead to something like the opening up of the abyss. Maybe not that exact event, but something like it. And I think there's a reason why Jesus, in his return, says that the skies will roll up like a scroll. And then in Isaiah, a similar thing is repeated that, you know, basically the mountains, everything is out of place when the heavens recede like a scroll. And it gives credence to who's actually in control and why he would have to do that. Now remember, think about this. In Noah's flood, God had to flood the earth to get rid of the problem, which was the Nephilim, the abomination, right? Now, the second time, this second coming of his, as outlined in scripture, seems to suggest that there needs to be created a new heaven and a new earth. Something substantial, I think, is going to happen to our creation as we see it today. And perhaps this digital aspect of it has a role to play in destroying or causing the decay or what necessitates God to restore creation. Let me explain why, and let me explain why this is a CERN watch video. Now, some of you guys might be thinking, why is this even a CERN watch? But here's why. CERN just recently released 300 terabytes of Large Hadron Collider data for free, you know, out in the open for people to digest. Now, I'm not the person to do that. I know there's some of you guys out there who can, so I'll point you to the data and if you guys come up with stuff, great, share it with me. I'm willing to share it on the channel as long as it's interesting stuff. But there's something that really struck me as I was looking at all this information. Now, first of all, if you go to the CERN website, they have a page about computing. It says here approximately 600 million times per second particles collide with the LHC. Each collision generates particles that often decay in complex ways into even more particles and electronic circuits record the passage of each particle through a detector as a series of electronic signals and send the data to the CERN data center, the DC, for digital reconstruction. Did you all catch that? The data is sent to the CERN data center, duh, 
for digital reconstruction. Now, this got my brain all percolating because what have we been talking about? The intersection between reality and the digital realm as some sort of parallel event to something like the abyss opening or something like the spiritual dimension opening. Now, what if the digital reconstruction that occurs opens up an entire universe digitally? I think augmented reality and virtual reality will essentially converge into the same thing. We'll have devices that can either completely replace the real world with a virtual environment or we'll mix the two. I think there's two sort of strains of headsets that we're seeing, the more Google Glass style thing, which only gives you a small image in the corner of a field of view. And then we'll see another strain, which is the Oculus Rift type thing, which is designed to replace the entire world and give you as high resolution, bigger picture as possible. But eventually those two things will converge and it will be some sort of contact lens that goes in your eye and will give you both those things, the ability to do a huge image, high resolution, but also the ability to see through and mix images with the real world. At the moment, all the devices rely on projecting light into your eyes, so a much more successful way of doing this would be to bypass the eye altogether and directly interface with the brain. And we will be seeing things like this with cochlear implants on the hearing side, so the next step would be to look at a similar thing with the visual side. The inevitable future of these things, we think, is the integration to become tighter and tighter between the display and the human until we end up with a cyborg scenario where you have something embedded even inside your brain that has a direct interface to your, to your visual cortex. Okay, so what I'm saying here is we have already come to a place in programming and developing and computing to create virtual worlds. I mean, pretty substantial virtual worlds. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the, the world of Warcraft or whatever it is, video games, all kinds of stuff. We have been able to create entire pretty much civilizations. You have second life, right? There's all these different digital realms that have been created by man and uh, that capacity is there. Now, what if we get some packet of information or some sort of reconstruction that unlocks in the digital realm? Because remember, they're reconstructing it in the digital medium or that field. Is it possible that there is already data that has been captured? Because remember, they haven't been able to sort through all the data. Is it possible that some piece of data will open up a digital reality? The reconstruction will be such that it is actually a virtual world with entities in it. And so how would you explain that as materialists and scientists and physicists? If that happened, the only explanation you would have is that, oh, there's multiple dimensions and we figured out a way with one of our colliders to whatever, open up a black hole, which colliders have been said or suggested to do. And of course, the recent news about black holes might be portals into different dimensions or different realities. It all kind of seems like a setup for something like this to happen, where a digital reconstruction shows or opens up into a reality that we did not create, a virtual reality that we did not create. That's the point here. And it will tap into the extraterrestrial conversation, and it'll tap into the spiritual conversation and all these things. Now, here's why, let me tie this back to Dr. Heiser's stuff. Here's why understanding Dr. Heiser's divine counsel perspective is so important, because he is basically laying out biblically what's going on in the spiritual realm. And through this digital thing that's gonna happen, this revolution, this reconstruction that may open up into worlds that we can only imagine, right? And interact in the physical realm as well, because obviously with the development of nanotechnology and wearable technology, biological technology, synthetic biology, leading to black goo, all that stuff tying in, this virtual reality will have the capacity or ability to manifest in our physical world in ways that we thought were just science fiction. Okay, so th this is what I'm talking about. This is what I've been saying all this time is that if there is some sort of opening, a digital reconstruction, which opens up a world that we did not create, a virtual world with all the rules and parameters that we did not create, intelligent minds that we are interacting with. How does that shape or change human society? And how does it shape or change our behavior and our belief systems and our worldview? You know, this is the other thing that I don't think most people are prepared for is a major shift in worldview. You know, we have lived through the materialist sort of paradigm and that's dying, right? We've been documenting that for a few years now about how the supernatural worldview is taking over academia and just, you know, sort of going back to the roots of humanity, so to speak. I don't think most of humanity have been hard, staunch materialists. You know, most human beings, I think, have believed inherently or taught or whatever that there are spiritual realities, supernatural realities, something out there. 
even if they don't know exactly what it is or identify it as God or anything, most human beings, I believe, have that sense, even those who call themselves atheists. So that's just my personal opinion based on my survey of humanity thus far, and obviously I haven't met everybody on the earth or everybody that has ever existed, so I wouldn't know, but just an opinion formed on my experiences. But getting back to this stuff here, the other part of it that's interesting is that they're opening it up to the public. Now, 300 terabytes of data isn't a ton, okay? They go through a lot more data or they collect a lot more data than that. So it's one of those things where, you know, how much data is actually there and what can we expect as we start to reconstruct this data? What if somebody comes forward and says, hey, there is a coded message here. There's an intelligent message here. Then think about it. The onus is off sort of the institution, right? If some rogue person or just a random, you know, armchair physicist or whatever came up with a theory that says, hey, there's some intelligent communication happening here, let's investigate it. And, you know, that happens to be the unlocking, right? Or the opening or what leads to the opening. Kind of like the movie Stargate, you know, there's a code and all this stuff and they figure it out and boom, the portal opens, you know, something to that nature, something that looks like that. What if that happens? Then again, it's off the onus of the institution. They can keep it underground. It could be funded by the military or whatever. And I mean, it is just crazy. Now, speaking of military, let me just drop this in here because it's recent news. And I think it's relevant to this little rant here. United States General Mark Milley of the U.S. Army Chief of Staff spoke at Norwich University for an ROTC program celebration, the 100th anniversary, and this U.S. general had some very interesting words for the cadets. You're going to follow in a long line, and you're entering into a very, very turbulent era. And there's no doubt in my mind that the training you've received here, the cohesion, the competence, and the character building that you have earned and learned here at Norwich is going to stand you well in the face of arguably some difficult times ahead. And we're going to need your leadership, every ounce of it, for that I am sure. And our sons and our daughters of this nation deserve good leadership. If you look at readiness, you look at combat power, the most important element of that is not technology. It's not the guns, the planes, and the ships. It's not the weapons. It's not the computers, it's the people, and most importantly, it's the leaders. And that's what Norwich does. Leadership is far and away the most important element. But character and compassion and competence are skills that you're absolutely going to have to deal with. Part of that also is going to have to be your intellectual development. You're going to have to be open-minded and adaptive to be able to deal with the complexity of the world that involves so many different dynamic elements that it's hard to describe in sentences. If the world of 1916 was complex, or the world of 1945 was complex, the world of 2016 is intensely complex. And I can tell you that from personal experience, and I know there's many others who can tell you that as well. And you will graduate and be in that world, and you're gonna be leading the soldiers and the sailors, the airmen and the Marines in that world. You'll be dealing with terrorists, you'll be dealing with hybrid armies, you'll be dealing with little green men, you're gonna be dealing with tribes, you'll be dealing with national leaders and local leaders, you'll be dealing with politics and economics, and you'll be dealing with direct fire and indirect fire, and you're gonna be dealing with it all and it's all gonna be dealt with simultaneously. And for that, you're gonna to have to be ready. And that's why readiness, in my mind, uh, is number one. Now, a very interesting statement, and everybody is focusing on, obviously, the hybrid armies and little green men comment. But did you notice just his cadence there when he said it, but also the commentary surrounding it about character, about being strategic with different ways of having to be strategic and new ways to be able to cooperate. And, you know, there is a part of me that senses when I listen to General Mark Millet talk, it gives me the sense that he has perhaps seen some very interesting things, some things that would only make sense in the world of science fiction. 
And whatever he's seen, it's probably so strange that the only way he can even hint at it in a speech like this is to say the words hybrid army and little green men. Now, of course, everyone's been breaking down what that means. And, you know, there are more mundane interpretations of that. But regardless, I think he knew that this phrasing would have the kind of weight or spark that will create conversation. And again, nothing public like this is said on accident. So I think there's a reason why this stuff was said. Why would you say that unless you're trying to provoke something out of the people or they're trying to tell us something that is coming upon us? And I know it's strange that I would tie CERN into this whole thing, but if you are tracking with me about what's going on with the CERN and the opening of the dimensional rift or whatever it is, then you would recognize that a phrase like hybrid army would be consistent with the things that we've been tracking with transhumanism, with Dr. Hugo de Garris and his idea of creating three different classes of people and ultimately leading to giga death, right? Billion deaths on earth based on a coming war, which he calls the Artelect War. But what we're really talking about here is class war. There's going to be created different classes of human, a kind of human division that resembles the kind of human slavery that has existed on this planet for centuries, but at a different level because these humans will have some sort of fusion with technology, with the digital realm, with this other side, that they will literally be a different kind of people. And I think it ties into the mark of the beast and the worship of the image of the beast. And I think it all ties together. And, you know, again, if you've been tracking with me through this last at least year of looking at all these things, you would know what I'm talking about. So let me know your thoughts about this. I know it's strange. I know there's a lot of interesting dots to connect, but simply keep a sound mind and just know that this kind of stuff is going on. This is not stuff I'm just completely making up out of the blue. This is a convergence of what we're seeing, I believe, in my opinion, with biblical prophecy and with science and where it is headed. And the reason why when Jesus returns, he has to create a new heaven and a new earth. Hope you have an awesome day, guys. God bless.